noticed on the video that remembering was not in that list. And originally today, we were to welcome our conference president, Bill Miller, was supposed to be our guest speaker at Olney today. But as everything has changed, uh, he has rescheduled and will be with us next September. So we're looking forward to that and when we can see him in person. Uh, so I've added another thing for today, and it's one that the Lord just really put on my heart. And he put it on my heart before I understood why, before I started studying, remembering, and trying to figure out what's so powerful about remembering and why would God want us to focus on this. And he brought me to a passage in Joshua. So if you have Bibles, you can look at Joshua chapter 3. And this is such a powerful story tucked in here at the uh, Old Testament at the beginning of the Israelites entering the promised land. And I hope that you will see how life-changing the principle of remembering, remembering to beat the devil, can be. So in Joshua uh, chapter 3, and I've got my Bible here. You can use your device or whatever works best for you, but uh, I like to go old school and keep it right in front of me. So chapter three, my heading says crossing the Jordan. So after 40 years of wandering the wilderness, the Israelites are now at that moment. 40 years they've been waiting for this moment. 40 years dream is about to come true. And I don't know if you've had to wait for any dream in your life, if you had to wait for something that you thought come sooner, but took a long time. But when you get to that moment where it's actually coming, it's such an incredible, sweet moment, especially the longer you've waited, the more uh, excitement, the more joy that comes when that moment comes. And it says this, that early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out and went to the Jordan, that's the river, where they had camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. And here's the orders. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow the Ark. Follow the priests carrying the Ark. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark, and don't go near it. And Joshua told the people, verse 5, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for the Lord will do amazing things among you. I love this passage because God will do amazing things among you too. God is always up to amazing things. He's always wanting to do amazing things. He can do amazing things in your life. In fact, he can do amazing things at those times that seem least likely for God to work. At those times that seem the hardest, at those times that seem the worst. And 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, these people were not at their best. This was not their highest moment. But Joshua comes to them at this point and says, no, God's about to do amazing things. You must believe it. You must prepare yourself for it. Now, I imagine the Israelites could have turned their back once again. I imagine they could have said no. They could have complained. They could have grumbled. They could have said, no, we don't want to go in the promised land. There's Jericho right across the river. It looks really scary and it's well defended and it's got these huge walls and they probably have a strong military and you know we're just walking to our death you you remember that 40 years or 38 years earlier somewhere in that time frame they had had an opportunity to cross into the promised land and they had refused they were scared and they thought there's no way we can take the land and the people are much stronger and bigger and they panicked and and they 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 counseled with their fears and chose out of fear not to go into the promised land years and years before and they could have done that once again and i want to i want to put the context here for you because 
if you're going to apply this in your life, you need to know the whole context. And the context for each of us is that we also need to prepare. If God is going to do amazing things in your life, you have to be prepared for it. He's not going to just do it if you're not going to be ready to do your part. He's not going to just do it if you're not going to collaborate with him, if you're not going to be part of what he's doing. And there's a part to play. God doesn't just hand you things. He, he develops you. He grows you. He gives you the courage. He gives you the strength. He gives you the wisdom to make the right actions so that these amazing things can, can happen. And in this case, he's giving them the promised land, the land promised to Abraham many hundreds of years before. It's about to be fulfilled, but it's not going to come easily. It's not going to come without faith and courage. It's not going to come without the army. It's not going to come without the choir singing praise to God. It's not going to come without them moving into the land. You have to actually take a step. And what he's saying is, in order to take this land, you've got to let the priests go first, and they're carrying the ark, and that's significant because the ark is where God's presence dwells. It's where God was. It represented God going first. And one of the first things we have to remember in this remembering is that God must lead the way. If God leads the way, then you will have the victory. He will make the way. He will clear the path. But you have a part to play. You must follow. You must take that step. You must move forward. There's too many Christians, I think, that are just sitting, waiting, and letting God go ahead, and they're not following. They're not taking the step. They're not moving. They're not taking action. They're not doing anything. And they're complaining to God, God, well, as soon as you do it, God, or as soon as you make this happen, or as soon as you bring this person this magical person into my life, or as soon as you bring this magical job into my life. No, you have to cross the Jordan to get into the promised land. And so there is a role to play, and that's step one. You have to remember that God goes first, we follow, and we take those steps to meet him where he's leading. So the priests, uh, Joshua says to them in verse six, take up the Ark of the Covenant, and go ahead of the people. Man, <laughs> this is going to be hard for me. i got to keep this sermon uh, to a decent amount of time. But every verse in this passage preaches. Like, this is so powerful. Take up the Ark of the Covenant and go ahead of the people. Did you know that God is already ahead of you? That no matter what the future holds, and we're, of course, in this scary time where we're not sure what the future holds. We don't know how the economy is going to be. There's a lot of fears about that right now. We don't know if this is just a blip or if this is going to be a significant recession. We don't know if people are just temporarily losing their jobs or if a lot of people will not have jobs for a long time. We don't know what tomorrow looks like, but we know he's already there because he's already ahead of us. God is always ahead of you. He's waiting for you in the future. You don't have to worry about a future without God because he's there. He's ahead of you. And that's an incredible promise that we have to remember in order to move forward. Because no matter what who uh, no matter what happens in the future, no matter what the future will bring, our God is there. And through him, we can do all things. And so the priests go first. They go on ahead of the people. And you may remember the story. Uh, verse 7, the Lord said to Joshua, by the way, this is coming from the Lord. This is not Joshua just making up how they're going to do this. This is the instructions from the Lord. And he says, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. 
Now it will say a little bit later, uh, like in verse 15, listen to this, verse 15 of Joshua 3. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. So the river is raging. The river is at its highest level. The river is dangerous at this point. And he says, you're going to go and stand in the river. Part of the amazing way that God wants to work in your life is sometimes he calls you into that very difficult and challenging and even dangerous place so that he can do that amazing thing. Sometimes you have to get wet. Sometimes you have to put your feet in the water in order for the miracle to happen. If you do not take a risk, if you're not willing to get wet, if you're too scared of the raging waters, then God can never part the sea for you. If he's calling you through, he will make a way. But nothing is going to happen until you put your feet in the water. And look at the rest of verse 15. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing as soon as their feet hit the water. And one can only wonder what would have happened had they never put their feet in the water. What if they had just stood by the side of the river saying, God, can you stop the water so we can cross? When are you gonna stop the water? Why won't the water stop? We can't cross this river. It's too dangerous, it's too big. The current is too strong. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I felt like I'm in a raging river, <laughs> where I feel like the, the current of life is sweeping me away and there's just nothing I can do. I don't know about you, I've been in trials and, and situations and difficulties where it seemed like my life was in great danger of being swept away. Like I did not have much control. I did not have much power. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how I could get through this. I didn't know how I could cross through it. I don't know how I could get over it. The obstacles seemed too big. The trial seemed too severe. The pain was too great. The loss was too huge. But God is calling you, put your feet in the water. And this is a powerful secret to life. And Bear with me, it's a little tangent from our topic of remembering, but I want to share it because it's right here in scripture. One of the best and healthiest things we can do in life is that when problems come, when trials come, when pain comes, when suffering comes, when loss comes, it is much more healing and much more powerful to lean into it, to walk into it, to walk through it than to run from it. Our sinful human nature, it's our natural tendency to run from problems, to run from pain, to run from trials. I think it was the great uh, psychologist, uh, Carl Jung, uh, he said something along the lines of every um, mental illness is the result of avoiding legitimate suffering that all mental illness is rooted in our temptation to avoid all legitimate suffering and of course none of us likes to suffer none of us likes pain but the only way to get to the promised land is through the jordan you can't go backwards we saw what happens when you try to go backwards. You remember the Israelites when they first came to the promised land, they said, no way, we're not doing it. They're too strong, this, the enemies are too great. And they went backwards and they spent 40 years in the wilderness, which I think is a fitting metaphor for the way some of us have done our lives. We've been too scared of the pain. We've been too scared to make a risk. We've been too scared to be vulnerable, to be honest, to grow, to face the realities, to face the pain, to offer the forgiveness to surrender to what is. We've been too scared to do it, and so we run from it. And the problem is when we run from it, we only run back to the slavery we left. 
or we run into the wilderness where there's no supply, there's no help, there's no resources, and our lives are empty and dry and painful and meaningless. And there's so many people in our world right now that I feel like that is where they're at. They're in the spiritual wilderness trying to find a way, trying to find meaning, but they're hurting and unnecessarily so. And one of the ways we hurt is by running away from the challenges, running away from the pain, running away from the forgiveness, running away from that surrender of just letting go and accepting what is. And I'm not trying to minimize anybody's pain or difficulty or suffering or, or say that, that it's easy to accept it. It's easy to embrace it. It's not. It's really hard to move forward into the pain. It's really hard to move forward into the difficulty. Anyway, uh, I could preach all day on that one passage, but let's move forward in the story. So the priests go into the water, and it says, when their feet touch the water's edge. What a beautiful metaphor there. The waters from upstream stopped flowing. It piled in a heap a great distance away, and their path appeared in the water. And the priest, it says, walked down into the middle of the Jordan River. And they stood firm, verse 17, they stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan. And then all Israel could cross. And that day, Israel, after 40 years, finally walked into the promised land on dry ground. 40 years before, they had crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. They had left slavery. They had left Egypt. They had left their slave masters, their taskmasters. They had left a life where they were abused and mistreated. And they walked on dry ground into the wilderness to begin this journey to the promised land. And now some 40 years later, it is completed. It is fulfilled. And it's a day of rejoicing. And I notice that the Lord commands Joshua to do something very interesting on this special day. And if you go to... Uh, Joshua, the fourth chapter now, it says this. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men. This is coming from the Lord again, so it's important. Let's pay attention. Choose 12 men from a, among the people, one from each tribe. Tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood and to carry them over with you. So as these 12 men pass by the priests on their way through the Jordan River on dry ground, have them pick some large stones, put them on their shoulder and carry them out of the middle of the river and bring them to the other side. And he says in verse six, Oh, I'm sorry, in verse three, we're continuing. To carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together these 12 men. He had appointed them from Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones will be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. And the rest of the chapter goes on to tell how they do that very thing. They get the stones. They bring them out of the heart of the river that they then crossed on dry ground. And then they stack those stones in an altar. And they put that altar on the other side of the Jordan to mark the place where they crossed into the promised land miraculously as God did amazing things for them that day. Why was it important to God that they get these stones? 
why was it so important that God specifically instructed them to get the stones and create this memorial and to teach it to their children? It's important because God knows something that we forget. God knows that it is very important what we remember. I want to say that again. God knows that it is very important about what we remember. We have to remember the ways that God has worked for us in the past if we are to have the faith to meet the challenges of the future. And God knows that in our sinful condition, the things we often remember first are those bad things, the negative things, the things that went wrong, the trials, the suffering, the pain, all the ways that life did not go the way we wanted it. But he says, no, you need to intentionally remember how I have acted on your behalf in the past. You need to intentionally focus on those times when you thought you couldn't do it, when there seemed to be no way, and I made a way for you. To the point where you should build big stone memorials, and every time you pass this way, you'll see those stones and go, oh yeah, remember how we crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Wasn't that amazing? What an amazing God I serve because those memories will strengthen our faith for today and help us to know that we can face whatever comes in the future. Researchers have studied our brains and they have deduced and observed that we have this thing that happens. In fact, the researchers found that we remember negative things far more for far longer than we remember positive things. So whether it be negative words that someone says to us, we are much more prone to remember negative words than positive words that are said to us. We are much more prone to remember negative experiences than we are to remember positive experiences. And by the way, we are much more prone to talk about these negative things than we are to talk about the positive things. And you and I know this because we live it. It is our reality. You can go throughout a day, have 50 positive text messages or 50 positive emails, but then get that one text or that one email or someone is mad at you, or someone's upset at you, or someone does something or says something there that you don't like, and guess which one you'll be thinking about all day. Am I right? <laughs> you will be thinking about that one negative. Even though you got 50 others that were positive, it's that one negative that stays and plays in circles in your head. I can't believe they said that. I can't believe they did that, or I can't believe this happened. And that, in spite of all other positive things that may have happened, will become your memory for that day. Did you know that I can change your past? I'm sorry, let me reword that. Did you know you can change your past? And I can tell you how. A lot of the worst memories we have of our past a certain day, a certain week, a certain a moment, a certain experience. They are traumatic and they are worse because we focus on what bad thing happened. But do you know that at that same moment, some other good things were happening? Let me give you an example. In my life, uh, in fact, I even have a visual aid for this one. In my life, my fourth grade year was my worst year of school. And you don't even, if you ask me what was your hardest year in school, I don't bat an eye. I don't have to think about it. It's obvious. It's instant. I remember it. And let's see. Here I am. Get out of your picture. 
here I am in fourth grade. <laughs> this is my fourth grade picture. Uh, such a nice, cute little boy. Uh, yes, I was more redheaded and had freckles back then. But fourth grade was, quote, traumatic for me because I was bullied that year. And in our particular little church school, we had um, three grades. So I was in fourth and we were with the fifth and sixth graders. So I was the youngest. And there was a sixth grader in our class that was not the most happy of people. And he took out a lot of his unhappiness on me, or at least it felt that way. And so when I think of fourth grade, I think about some of the things he did to bully me, which were pretty traumatic for me at the time. And he would say things and do things. And I remember one time he stole my shoes and threw them somewhere and I don't even know where they were and I was just going around without shoes and just crazy things that boys will do. Uh, but it was annoying, it was frustrating, and it was a bit humiliating because I was so small compared to him, I really couldn't do much. And so I remember telling the teacher and the teacher helped a little bit and I remember telling my parents. I remember it getting so bad that my parents talked to the teacher and I remember just having days where I didn't want to go to school because I didn't know what he was gonna do to me that day. And I could look at my fourth grade year and I could say, wow, that was a terrible year. It was a traumatic year. So glad that I made it through that. But guess what? A lot of other good things happened that year. One of the things is once you made it to fourth grade at my little school in Bend, Oregon, we lived right at the base of Mount Bachelor. Mount Bachelor is a ski resort out in Oregon, still there to this day, and pretty popular. And our school would go skiing every Monday. They would take all the fourth grade and up onto the mountain, and we got to go skiing for school. Now, I'm not quite sure how that qualified as schooling, but I was not complaining. And I, to this day, still rank it as one of my favorite things I've ever done in any school. And all of my friends were with me. I mean, this was like a weekly birthday party. When else do you get to get all your friends together and go skiing when you're in fourth grade? And we did it eight times that winter. Every Monday for eight weeks, we went up on the mountain, we skied, we had a blast, we hung out together. I'm sure there were adults somewhere, but I don't remember them. It was just me and my friends on the mountains. And of course we were goofing off, having fun. And it was a blast. So I can remember fourth grade as the great year that I got to go skiing for school. Or I could remember fourth grade as the year where that terrible bully made my life miserable. And I have a choice about that. You see, the danger is that we only focus on the negative, that the negative becomes so uh strong in our minds that it starts to push out every other positive memory you know psychologists tell us this is what happens when your marriage starts to go bad that you start to look on your whole marriage and only see all the bad times and all the fights and all the disagreements and one of the things that marriage counselors often try to do is they ask you, why did you first fall in love? What brought you together? Because they need you to remember the good. And there's something really dangerous when we start to remember only the bad. It's like the bad has this power to creep into our entire past and rewrite our story. And we've all met people like that. And some of you have friends like this. Every time you talk to them, all they can talk about is all the bad things that have happened to them. Have you met those people? And you can ask them, <laughs> in fact, sometimes in frustration, I don't know if you've ever been there like me, sometimes I get frustrated after they've gone on and on and on and I, I just have to ask something about, well, did anything good happen in your childhood? <laughs> 
Did, did you have one good time in your marriage? Or you were married 15 years. You must have had one good memory. And you have to re realize the danger of our sinful nature is that it will cling to the negative, to the bad, to the evil, and that will start to push out all of the good. And I hope in this context, you're starting to see how important and powerful it is why God wants us to remember his actions, his miracles, the things he's done, so that we do not get caught up in seeing our whole life through the devil's eyes. The devil loves nothing more than to get us look on our look back on our lives and see all the bad and see all the times where we were hurt and all the pain and all the loss and all the people that have done us wrong. And we miss out on all the amazing things, to quote Joshua, all the amazing things God has done in our lives. And guess what? God has done amazing things in your life. Now, if you can't see it, that's on you. But I know my God, and I know he's done amazing things for each one of us. And you guess what? If you haven't seen all the amazing things you want to see, then you need to start remembering the few he's done and exercising the faith for more amazing things. He won't do them if you don't expect them and if you don't want them. Remember, they had to follow the ark. They had to go into the river. But that comes from the faith of remembering what God has done, remembering who God is, remembering his love for you, remembering his grace towards you, remembering all the amazing things that he has done so that we can believe he will do them in the future. I think it's in the book, uh, Desire of Ages, where Ellen White makes the statement about, we have nothing to fear for the future except that we forget how God has led us in the past. If we can remember what God has done in our past, we will make it through whatever comes our way in the future. God wants to work mightily in our lives. All right, I have one more picture here. <laughs> Let's see if I can let you see it. This is, uh, I'll come over here. This is me in college. And uh, I know you're getting a good laugh as I am about it. Now the question, uh, I'm the one in the shirt. So yeah, this is, sorry for my friend. I won't tell you who that is so that he will not be embarrassed. I will tell you he is a pediatric radiologist now. So in spite of this picture, he made something of himself. <laughs> it's far more successful than most of us. But this picture was taken at midnight in a dorm room at Southern College. And we are both grinning from ear to ear because of the reason we were up at this late hour. And the reason we were up at this hour is because it was my brother's birthday. And he was a year behind me at Southern. And uh, my friend here and I, we decided that we thought it would be really funny if we totally ignored my brother on his birthday all day that we pretended we had forgotten it was his birthday, that we made no mention of it, and that we got him nothing special and did nothing special, and uh, that we would then let that go the whole day so that he would feel that we had forgotten. And this is uh, probably a bit on the cruel side, but I can assure you this was not out of uh, this is very typical behavior for the, all of us group of friends. And we thought it would be a good joke or prank to pull on him. And to cap off the prank, we waited until he had gone to bed. We set our alarms for midnight. He went to bed around 10 or so that evening. And um, at midnight, we snuck into his room and started singing at the top of our lungs, happy birthday with a cake that we had gotten on clearance at the local grocery store across the street. And so we marched into his room in the dark, flipped on the lights, started singing at the top of our lungs, happy birthday, like one minute before his birthday technically ended. 
And <laughs> then to make matters worse, I had written a little happy birthday note and placed it under the cherry that was in the middle of his cake. And he in his grogginess and sleepiness was kind of looking at us from his bed and I can remember it as if it was yesterday after we sang our happy birthday and he kind of grinned and then kind of scowled at us and said, yeah, thanks a lot guys. And I said, hey, we brought you a present. And he said, okay, and I showed him the cake and I said, look, I wrote a little note for you. And so he looked down and there was this little piece of paper under the cherry, which was strategically placed because the minute he bent down to look at the cake, I swung the cake up to hit him in the face. That was the whole plan of the happy birthday. <laughs> this is what you do in college, apparently. Uh, but when I did that, uh, the cake missed because he had good reflexes. Uh, curse those, those John's reflexes are a little too fast. So I missed him. And luckily I was able to keep a hold on the cake so the cake didn't go flying. And we all had a good laugh and I said, fine. And so I handed him the cake and we were talking. And then he said, hey, Rick, what's this? And he pointed something on the cake and I kind of leaned in dumbly as you can imagine. And then he threw the cake up at my face which hit half my face and the rest of it hit the ceiling. Uh, and that was the end of the cake for that night. Uh, but before the cake had gotten destroyed, we had taken the picture that I showed you to commemorate my brother's birthday, which I'm assuming was probably birthday 19, though I can't quite uh, remember if it was 18 or 19. It was one of those for him. So my brother has a choice. He can remember his birthday as that day when nobody remembered, nobody did anything. Or it was that one night when a couple of crazy friends came in and tried to smash a cake in his face to show their love for him. And I'm not sure which way he remembers it, but I'm pretty sure we all do remember it because we did something special and unique for him, albeit a little crazy on his birthday. And we have the picture that reminds us. And every time I see that picture, I am filled with joy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe too much joy, but uh, it was a very positive memory for me. And this is the power of remembering the good time. Now, did I have a lot of stress in college? Did I have some really bad moments in college? I did. Did I have some heartaches in college? Absolutely. But I'm so glad I remember this one night with my brother and how I tricked him and how I got the cake and how we sang happy birthday to him at midnight, because that was meaningful, that was special. And all the, the, the power that we can harness from remembering can and will change your life, because what you remember is important. That's why God put it in the scripture. There's a reason, by the way, that God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's an interesting part that he put in the Ten Commandments, written in stone. Remember this day. And you know what's interesting? He goes on to say, remember, because in six days, the Lord created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. So he says, remember this day, because it's a day you're supposed to remember every week that he's the creator. Because we need that. Because remembering is a powerful force to beat the devil. And so every week, God wants us to take 24 hours to remember who he is. To remember that he created all these good things that we see. If we start to remember every single week that he is a good God, he is the source of life and love and happiness, that all the beauty we see, especially here at the springtime, all of that is from him. He's a God of beauty. He's a God who loves to make our lives beautiful. That's who he is. And what's interesting, I can, I can even double the meaning here. When you get to Deuteronomy in chapter 5, and Moses is reciting the Ten Commandments to them, he changes the Fourth Commandment, and he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, because God delivered you from Egypt, and he brought you into the Promised Land. 
and he brought you out of slavery. And he says, that's what you should be doing on Sabbath. So there's two things that God wants us to remember every single week when we remember the seventh day Sabbath. He wants us to remember that he is the creator, that he's the source of life and beauty and all this majestic stuff that he made for us and the and the family and the friends and all these beautiful things he created for us. And he wants us to remember he brought us out of sin. He brought us out of slavery. He redeemed us. Not only did he create us, he redeemed us. And if we would keep those things foremost in our mind, I think that would affect our daily life. I think that would change us. I think that would change how we view others. I think it would change how we view our past. It would change us from being victims to being blessed. It would change us from being powerless to being powerful. It would change us from seeing life as a thing of scarcity to life being this abundant blessing and gift from God. I am so glad that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, that I have this day once a week where I take time to remember what really is worth remembering. And to sum it up, I was listening to a report on psychologists who did this study on how we tend to remember the negative. And their conclusion, I'll never forget, they said, what we've discovered is when it comes to negative and bad experiences, our brains are like Velcro. But when it comes to good experiences and positive words, our brains are like Teflon. <laughs> that was the official scientific conclusion of these scientists about their study. And no wonder God says to remember. Because we have to make an intentional effort to remember the good. It does not come natural to our sinful nature, to these sinful bodies where we naturally remember the bad, but we forget the good. And so God is commanding us. God is encouraging us. You must choose to remember. And if you need to take some stones and build a memorial, if you need to keep a journal, if you need to mark it, if you need to take a picture, if you need to do something to help you remember so you do not forget when God does something amazing in your life, do whatever you need to do, but whatever you do, do not forget. Do not forget how God has led you. Do not forget what God has done in your past. And I wish we had time today. I know we don't, but I wish we had time. I would love to hear your stories, something God has done in your life how God has brought you through something because we need to tell those stories. We need to share those stories. We need to remember those stories. We need to focus on those stories. I can absolutely change your past if you will just start focusing on all the ways God has brought you through and not on all the ways that life has beat you up. You are not a victim. You are a child of God. And I know bad things have happened and I know you've been through pain and I know you've been through suffering. I know you've been through trials. But God has still brought you through. You're here today. And he's asking you to remember that. He's asking you to remember what he has done. And I want to remember what God has done in my life. And I hope that you will make it a priority. Because if you don't, that Velcro brain of yours will just latch on to all the bad. And that will become your life. And that will be your life story. Or you can heed the words of, of Jesus to Joshua. Remember, take these stones out of the Jordan. When God does something, when he makes a way, you mark it down, you memorialize it, you talk about it, you tell it to your children, and you worship and praise him because he is a good God. And you remember that if he set you free once before, he'll do it again. And ultimately, one day, he'll bring us into the ultimate promised land. That's what we need to remember. So we're...